Hey, what up everybody? CB Breach coming to you. Came home from work, started looking around. Everybody's watching the UFC show, so there's not really uh, much a buzz going on with people to talk to. Uh, you know, looked around online and saw a story that it's been 15 years. Today's the 15th year anniversary of the WCW Nitro match between Goldberg and Hollywood Hogan, where uh, Hollywood Hogan dropped the belt and Goldberg took off and um, put the exclamation point on the career. Uh, it's debatable on uh, how big of a star many people think Goldberg is, if he is one of the true WCW legends or if he was just the biggest star in a very very small pond um, honestly in my book I've never really thought of Booker T as like this huge star he just was the guy that was the champion five times when the you know the sand was running out of the uh, time capsule in WCW he just happened to be that guy, if it would have been a little bit earlier, if this, you know the stars would have stayed, or if um, they could have put everybody there, I don't think Booker T ever would have been in that role that he was in. Um, awfully nice that he got his uh, career, um, uh, you know, highlighted with him being in the Hall of Fame this year. But um, Goldberg is a guy that I think a lot of people honestly really. Uh, I don't want to say overrate because if you if you're a fan of his, you're a fan of his. But I think people sort of uh, maybe talk about his accomplishments like they were more than what they really were. Yeah, he you know when he uh, I, I just watched this match uh, of uh, Hogan versus Goldberg because I was interested to check it out and I wanted to make like a review of uh, going to the show and what the match was all about. Watching it back today. But, um, you know, when he won the title, he was uh, on an undefeated streak of 107-0. and zero. For much of that streak, he was fighting guys that were jobber-quality stars on Nitro and on, on um, Thunder was the other show on pay-per-views. Like, the biggest, you know, rivalries that he was involved with... Uh, on his way to the top was like Steve Mongo with Michael uh, because they were both football guys. Um, you know, he, he had a small rivalry uh, with Raven when he won the United States title. But uh, the, he was always just that guy that was just like, we don't really need to make a program for him. He'll just, you know, go out there. The fans will cheer for him and he'll win his match. You know, let's uh, make sure that we get, uh, you know, the big programs for all the other guys that are there because he's already getting a reaction and that's about it. Um, how they got him to be this loved and uh, how everybody um, cheered for this guy, I have no clue. Uh, but it must have just been, it must have just been that he was going to go out there Fans really didn't turn on him until he won the title and he really started giving promos. Um, to that point, he was that guy who never really spoke. And when he did speak, it was just not that much. And, uh, you know, he just had the philosophy of going, on out, going out there, you know, kick a whole lot of ass and not really sell that much. And at that point, I guess that's what people thought was exciting. Because, uh, you know... Uh, with Nitro on one channel and Raw on the other, you know, if uh, it wasn't that exciting and your guy wasn't, you know, uh, it, in the advantage of the match, more than likely you would flip over to see what the other guys were doing. Uh, I can remember uh, 1998, uh, school was out because it was the middle of July. Uh, me and my buddy bought tickets for this. Honestly, about a month in advance, we went to our local Publix, which is a grocery store, and we bought the tickets there. Um, you know, and we were all hyped up to go to this show. Um, for some reason, I can remember he almost wasn't able to go, and he was my ride. This was the first wrestling event that I ever went to alone, and I don't think it would have been that big of a deal, uh, because in 1998, I would have been 17 years old. Uh, but I didn't tell my mom I was going to the show until after I got home. It was sort of like one of those things where... Um, you know, I'll ask for forgiveness instead of asking for permission because, um, we didn't get home from the Georgia Dome, even though we lived in Atlanta, um, until like one o'clock, if I can remember. It was definitely after midnight. It was closer to one, I can remember, because I remember I got a little talking to about letting her know where I was going to be. Um, but it wasn't the hugest ordeal because, you know, I was 17, um, years old at the time. But, um, this... 
was just like, if you watch the whole Nitro, which I don't think is available unless you have it on like a bootleg DVD, which I'm sure I have it tucked away somewhere, I just didn't want to dig it out. I can remember off the top of my head though that honestly, this was a uh, three hour show and um, I don't know why I was able to sit through three hour shows and never complain about them back there, but now maybe because you're not able to switch channels like with the other thing, like if, if Nitro sucked ass there was, for the first hour, you had to you, know, you had to uh, live up with it. But I mean, like, if it was during the prime hours that Raw was on, if anything sucked, you just flipped over. Maybe Raw needs some competition. Maybe it was a uh, wasn't a um, a great idea that, that TNA packed up their bags and left on us. But um, I honestly think that um, you you were able to sit through those three hour shows back then. But nothing happened on the show. Um, you know, if if you watched the weeks before. Uh, if you didn't live in Atlanta, nobody fucking knew about this match unless you were the dirt sheets. This was a straight up dark match. Uh, like what they want you to go, like, to see. SmackDown has a lot of dark matches all the time. Raw matches, everybody goes to Raw because it's fucking live TV. But, uh, everybody knows that SmackDown, you're very lucky if you get one of the big stars. Like, they had CM Punk on there on, on, uh, um, Friday night, so he was at the Tuesday taping, and, you know, John Cena's not normally there. But if they're going to some, you know, um, small town in the middle of nowhere, uh, they'll, you know, act like there's going to be some big match uh, to, to draw you to come in when they show you the commercials on TV or they have the, the flyers around town uh, or maybe even they put a poster up at the Ticketmaster uh, where you're going to go buy your tickets up uh, saying, like, I don't know, fucking John Cena versus Big Show, Steel Cage. And they go out there at the end after the taping's all over and they go out there and have a four-minute match. Uh, to send everybody home happy that uh, John Cena wins in a steel cage match. But that's basically what this was going to be. Goldberg, the hometown boy, was going to take on Hulk Hogan in what was the um, uh, uh, you know, the, the World Heavyweight Champion at the time. So it was like Goldberg's first shot at the main event, and he was supposed to draw fans uh, to the Georgia Dome. I know everybody went to the Georgia Dome at WrestleMania 27, or they watched it on TV, or they have a DVD now. But uh, the way the Georgia Dome used to be set up back in the day was they used to run half of the dome, like where you would put the 50 yard line, they would put the big old frickin' tarp, they'd pull it all the way across, and that's where they'd set up the set, and uh, the backstage would be the other side of the football field, and they'd fill up the other uh, side of the arena, and they'd put some floor seats down on the floor to fill up where the ramp was, uh, so it wasn't be like, you'd be like, hey, they only have three uh, three quarters of the uh, the arena filled up. Uh, they they made it show really really full. And for a wrestling uh, you know show, if it wasn't for going to WrestleMania in 27 and seeing the whole fucking arena, except for where the end zone was, where they uh, they built the stage over there, uh, full, it was the, the biggest show that I had ever been to. And it was still, even though I've been to WrestleMania, is one of the craziest atmospheres I've ever been to. I always give a little bit of nudge to the first ECW house show that I ever went to because it was in the uh, Gwinnett Civic Center in a much smaller arena. Not the, you know, the, they, they tore down this Gwinnett Civic Center and built the other Gwinnett Civic Center that they do the, uh, they do some SmackDown shows at and they, they did a pay-per-view back in like, I think they did like Armageddon 2004, 2005, one of those shows was there and, and uh, this that was a new arena they built on top of the old arena, but um, except for that, I mean, this place was 99% Goldberg fans, everybody brought signs, everybody brought shirts, there was some sporadic NWO Hollywood Hogan fans in there like myself, and uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been to a show with me or just... Um, you can tell by watching my videos that I make when I go to the shows. I'm a very loud person. I get very into watching wrestling. And um, I don't want to say that I get to the point where I make people embarrassed around me. But um, I let people know that I'm there. And um, uh, I go to some baseball games. And people like to think that I'm the drunkest guy in the crowd. And I'm, I don't really uh, typically drink when I go to things like this that much. Because they have to drive home from them. But, um, you know... Uh, every time there was a Goldberg chant, Goldberg, Goldberg, like they did back in the day, I would do the freaking um, Hogan chant. I would just chant, Hogan, Hogan. But um, somehow in between, you know, uh, I think it was actually on Thursday, which is very late for a Monday, uh, Doug Dillinger came on to a Thunder, which nobody watched. Um, so it didn't really help out them uh, with the number at all. But I'm sure the word spread throughout the internet and the dirt sheets and everything like that throughout the day. And just word of mouth from the small uh, amount of fans that did watch it that you know could tip people off that it was going to be there. But uh, Nitro always had the advantage because they started at 8 and Raw didn't start till 9. 
um, that they'd be able to tell people, uh, the wrestling fans that would come in and tune in an hour early, that they were having this match and it was going to be the main event. But anyways, Doug Dillinger comes out there and changes his mind. It's no longer going to be a dark match to sell tickets. It's actually going to be on TV if you ever go on and you watch the uh, freaking um, uh, Hulk Hogan interviews and jazz like that. He's the guy who says that it was all his idea to put the belt on the Goldberg. He can tell how hot he was. But... The flip side of the story was that Hogan beat Goldberg because he wanted the return on the end. He wanted to be the first guy to beat Goldberg. Everybody sort of agreed to this, even though it never really played out, and Kevin Nash was the guy that got to beat him. Um, I think it's Starcade um, later in the year. Um, so it's sort of the Goldberg title run. Once they put the belt on him, he got real hot, but he sort of fizzled out because he didn't really have any stuff competition. Um, you can tell by watching the match, which plays into the review in a little bit, but uh, Hogan was already booked to fight in a mixed tag. It was going to be Hogan and Rodman against DDP and uh, Carl Malone. Um, uh, Kurt Henning was already involved in a feud over the United States Championship with uh, Goldberg, so you know, like, when you go to your first pay-per-view as your new champion and you're fighting a guy like Kurt Henning, which is a great wrestler, but he was nowhere in the main event scene. He was definitely a hardcore mid-carder with that United States Championship. Throughout his whole WCW run, you're going to look a little weird. You know, it took a few months before he was battling guys uh, like Sting and DDP and other guys. Uh, once we finally got down to business, this match is only about nine minutes uh, the atmosphere was crazy. Everybody was going wild. NWO threw some pranks in during the show, uh, saying that he wasn't gonna, uh, Goldberg wasn't gonna be able to get his title shot until he beat uh, a mystery person who ended up being Scott Hall. It returned. He'd not been in WCW uh, due to some, uh, I guess you can say, family and self problems. He hadn't been there in about three months, so he actually got a pretty good pop. that came out there. Goldberg destroyed him like he was no man's business. So the match was finally on and set for the main event. Uh, the whole match itself is like 17 minutes long, but the actual match-match part of it is only about 8 minutes. Uh, they definitely, um, you know, knew to control Goldberg and not really just overuse him. The matches is a lot of headlocks um, from Hogan and from Goldberg. Uh, not much a real battling action, I guess you can say. Goldberg sells a few punches from Hogan, which is the normal thing. Hogan uses the strap on him. Um, you know, the match is going, and it is what it is. It's nothing really spectacular. I would definitely put it in my top ten Hulk Hogan matches, which is a good idea for a video I should make someday. But, um, just from the atmosphere, but the match itself is nothing really that great. Uh, Kurt Henning makes his way down to the ring like he's going to interfere and uh, help Hogan keep the belt. DDP uh, comes down with Carl Malone, who was uh, in Atlanta for the night for no apparent reason other than to be on WCW Nitro. Um, he just simply walks up behind Henning, spins him around, gives him a diamond cutter, and uh, DDP and Malone, the place erupts. Uh, after that, Goldberg really just hits the spear out of nowhere, uh, hits him with a jackhammer, which you know honestly takes forever uh, for him to pick him up. You can definitely see that he's living in the moment and in front of his hometown crowd. Uh, you know, you know, jackhammers him down, pins him, uh, and takes the strap. Um, it was fun back in those days to go to the crowds because the WCW crowds were very interactive. Um, everybody threw shit in the ring, no matter what happened at the end of Nitro or at the end of the pay per view. Uh, we tried to be, uh, we weren't, we were sitting in the last row of the hundreds. We weren't in the in the decks. We were on, you know, on that little incline, the risers that rise up. We were sitting in the last seats in front of the uh, freaking things. Uh, we tried to throw things in the ring that we had never seen before to see what was going to happen. Uh, we threw bags of, uh, pre-made bags of sugar that we had made in Ziploc bags, pre-made bags of flour. We wanted something that would hit the ring and sort of make a poof of smoke like something was going on. I don't know if we were like uh, hinting at the uh, freaking uh, warrior uh, coming later in the next year. Or uh, what we were trying to do, but yeah, that was a little bit of something. And maybe he, I think Warrior came in '98. I think he came in October uh, at Halloween Havoc. But uh, we also threw uh, toilet paper, uh, threw some jars of uh, not jars, but you know plastic jugs of mustard. So when they hit, you'd see that 
of yellow, uh, which is actually the only thing that hit the ring that I threw, and you can see it at the very end of during the celebration. Uh, not my proudest moment as a wrestling fan that I did it, but definitely one of the biggest events that I ever went to, and uh, very awesome. Jim and I still ask me to this day, almost weekly, about what it was like to be in there, and it was an awesome event to go to.